Monsters of the Market, Zombies, Vampires, and Global Capitalism by David McNally. This is part three of chapter two. Self-birthing, capital, and the alchemy of money. Money has thus always exercised grotesque powers in capitalist society, literally capable of determining who shall live and who shall die. In late capitalism, these awesome powers assume ever more mysterious and elusive forms. Much of this has to do with the processes of financialization, which have greatly expanded the range of interest-bearing activities by capital, and whose basis I shall explore shortly. But as financialization pivots on the intrusion of credit, debt, and interest payments into ever more spheres of social reproduction, we need first to interrogate the phenomenon of interest-bearing capital itself. As we have seen, Marx's analysis of capital pivots on the critical insight that the formula MCM conceals material transformations that occur in the hidden abode of production. To capture the esoteric movement of capital, he advances the expanded formula MC, MP plus LP, CM. This allows him to show how beneath the sphere of circulation of commodities and money, MCM, capital expands by exploiting labor, appropriating surplus value, and reinvesting much of it in new forces of production. But Marx was well aware that not all capitalists profit through purchasing means of production in order to produce commodities and the surplus value they contain. In the complex structure of capitalism, some capitals confine themselves to purely financial transactions. Take banks, for instance, which are specialized institutions that pool and store financial savings and lend them at interest. Banks do not organize the production of commodities, and they do not oversee the creation of surplus value, but they do make profit. This profit, based largely on interest from loans, derives either from workers' wages when loans are made to wage earners, or from surplus value on productive capital. In the latter case, a capitalist takes out a loan to finance machinery, equipment, or buildings, and then pays back interest and principal out of the surplus value generated by exploiting labor power that works with these means of production. Thus, even though the source of interest is the surplus value generated by living labor, it is the case for money lending capital that it can make a profit simply through the circuit MM by lending out money and receiving more in repayment. From the standpoint of the system as a whole, the circuit of financial capital thus mystifies the inner logic of capital. This is why interest-bearing capital is such a godsend for bourgeois ideology, according to Marx, since it mystifies the real social process by accruing profit without passing through the underworld of production. Appearing to generate profit without the mediation of labor, interest-bearing capital comprises an automatic fetish, money that seems capable of breeding more money from itself. Self-expansion appears here as an inherent property of money. Like the generation of trees, so the generation of money seems a property of capital in this form of money capital. The actual social relation without which capital cannot subsist, wage labor, is occluded. It thus appears as if the thing, money, commodity, value, is now already capital simply as a thing. In this pure fetish of money capital, based on the circuit MM, we encounter a fantastic bourgeois utopia where capital endlessly gives birth to itself without entering the mundane world of labor and material production. It is striking that Marx returns in this context to his favorite line from Faust, for in the course of his discussion of interest-bearing capital, he intones that the money's body is now by love possessed. As soon as it is lent, interest accrues to it no matter whether it is asleep or awake, at home or abroad, by day and by night. Money here seems to participate in alchemy, the magical transformation of one material into another, particularly the translation of base metals into gold. Paper assets, not only bank loans, which are assets for banks because they draw interest, 
but stocks, bonds, promissory notes, or any other form of fictitious capital, look as if they possess an inherent capacity to metamorphose into material assets. In truth, fictitious capital merely represent, or fictitious capitals merely represent future claims on surplus value and profit, claims which become literally fanciful should the borrower default in the event of failure to generate adequate profits. Let us take the most elementary case of a fictitious capital, a share, a piece of paper that entitles its owner to a tiny portion of a company's future profits, if they ever materialize. Now, in principle, these stocks are backed up by material assets, means of production, stocks of goods, bank holdings. And these, when joined to labor, can generate commodities which, if sold in adequate numbers at sufficient prices, will yield profits. Should all this happen, paper claims on potential wealth can be realized as actual wealth. But in the world of finance and speculation, as Marx noted, these certificates can also become duplicates that can themselves be exchanged as commodities. In this case, a paper asset with only a potential value begins to operate as if it were a commodity, a repository of abstract labor. As prices for these paper titles to future wealth rise, a whole structure of hyper-fetishism arises, in which people frantically believe in the magical properties of paper assets to become ever more valuable. Rather than bearing a definite proportion to the value of the underlying real assets of a firm, paper assets seem to take on a life of their own, inflating without reference to anything real. This, as we shall see, has also given rise to absurd claims for a postmodern economy of speculation in which distinctions between the real and the fictitious no longer apply. Yet, as the crisis that broke in 2007 to 2008 revealed, just like every great crisis of capital before it, when such paper claims circulate as capital values, they are illusory, and their values can rise and fall quite independently of the actual capital to which they are titles. Eventually, the fictions will be exposed, the bubbles will be burst. Throughout the course of 2008, for instance, as something like $50 trillion in nominal wealth evaporated from the world's stock and credit markets, a financial cataclysm drove home the persisting difference between real between real and fictitious assets. This is not to say that fictitious capitals do not sometimes assist actual accumulation and that they do not have real social economic effects. It is to insist, however, that claims on future wealth are just that, claims that may or may not be realized. It is interesting in this regard that crucial parts of Faust deal with the magic of paper currency. When Faust, when Faust and Mephistopheles visits the emperor of a fictive kingdom, they instruct him and his lord treasurer in the new alchemy of money. Thanks to the magic powers of Mephistopheles, paper wealth is substituted for commodities, pearls or gold, and not being subject to the material limits of the latter. It acquires the capacity for infinite accumulation. Enchanted by the fantastic powers of paper money, the Lord Treasurer proclaims, I, get, I gladly take his colleague, the magician. In these crucial sections of his text, Goeth depicts the system of national paper money as a modern form of alchemy. It is clear that Marx intends something similar with his analysis of money and fictitious capital. Well, much clearer about the capacities of state-issued currencies and credit monies to drive a capitalist economy, Marx also recognized that in the realm of apparently free-floating paper assets, the line between truth and fiction, real capital and fictitious capital, seems to dissolve, particularly in the late capitalist world of proliferating financial instruments. Yet to take this as the truth, as the whole story, is to collude with the hyper-fetishism that obscures all connection of wealth to the world of labor, to the hidden abode of production. Now we can see the superficiality of the political economy of postmodernism advanced by theorists such as Jean Baudrillard and Jacques Derrida. As I have shown at length elsewhere, these postmodern thinkers take precisely these fetishes, 
fetishes, fetishes of financial capital at face value and imagine capitalism entirely in terms of self-birthing, self-expanding money. Money is the only genuine artificial satellite, writes Baudrillard. A pure artifact, it enjoys a truly astral mobility. It rises and sets like some artificial sun. Indeed, this pure artifact, this new solar center of the economy, involves a sort of ecstasy of value, utterly detached from production and its conditions, a pure empty form. Entranced by the seeming dematerialization of money and the increasingly esoteric operations of finance capital, a slew of postmodernist commentators have sealed their complicity with the fetishism of commodities by conjuring away the laboring bodies upon which the circuits of capital rest. A trendy anti-foundationalism thus becomes the frame for an account of postmodern society as a world without bodies, one in which we no longer need a critical theory of value to illuminate the hidden recesses of capitalist social life. Baudrillard shrinks from none of these conclusions proclaiming the end of labor, the end of production, the end of political economy, and announcing that we have arrived at the end of the scene of the body. Postmodernist theory of this sort thus mimics late capital's own narrative, in which sweatshops and bodies in pain have been erased by the digitized circuits of the so-called age of information. In so doing, it utterly fails as a critical theory entirely unable to account for traumatic global financial meltdowns of the sort that started in the summer of 2007 and the very real suffering, ruin and death they spread. In forfeiting a hermeneutics of suspicion in the face of the preposterous self-representations of late capitalism, in refusing to see contradiction and crisis at the heart of capitalism and its financial forms, such postmodern theory exposes itself as mere apologetics, as uncritical theory. This is not to deny that there are new forms of finance capital, to which I turn shortly, unique to the era of neoliberal globalization. It is to insist, however, that these urgently require the sort, the sort of decoding performed by Marx. And it is to remind ourselves again that the great virtue of a major genre of monster stories, from Frankenstein to the urban vampire tales flourishing throughout the African subcontinent, is their obsessive tracking of the human bodies and unseen labors that feed the machinery of accumulation. More than this, in insisting that something monstrous is at work and in warning of the risks global financial circuits pose to human bodies, these fables can equip us with a form of night vision that illuminates the neoliberal world of wild money. Wild money, the occult economies of late capitalist globalization. Late capitalism is a conjurer's realm of wild money. So demonically out of control is financial wealth that like an apparition, it appears able to materialize in monstrous concentrations only to melt away just as quickly. Take, for instance, the December 2001 collapse of Enron, a company ranked months earlier as the seventh largest in the United States. A mere year before, as it generated over $100 billion in revenues, Enron was publicly valued at $65 billion. Then, as if at a wizard's command, all that wealth simply vanished sold some weeks after declaring bankruptcy fortune magazine's five times or five time most innovative company in america went for nothing literally nothing or consider the even more staggering collapse of venerable investment firm lehman brothers in the fall of 2008 which shattered confidence in global markets prior to its crash lehman was valued at more than 690 billion dollars it too went for almost nothing. If we seek to understand the occult economy of late capitalism and its cryptic world of enchanted wealth, it would be hard to find better case studies than Enron and Lehman Brothers. For here we encounter in pristine form the bizarre workings of capital today. 
Yet, to truly grasp these debacles, we must move beyond the mainstream tale of corporate greed and corruption. However much Enron or Lehman offer paradigmatic examples of fraud and deceit, what brought them down goes much deeper than that. Their pathologies were systemic, not idiosyncratic. Even one mainstream journalist has observed that the Enron tale is the story of how American capitalism worked at the close of the, seventh, of the 20th century. And that larger story, to which I return shortly, is also the tale of the 2008 disintegration of all five Wall Street investment banks, none of which can be divined outside an analysis of what has happened to global capitalism and how world money has transmuted since about 1970. Capitalism has always been prone to wild financial speculation, followed by great crashes. But there is something unique about the forms taken by speculative bubbles throughout the recent history of capitalism, their inherence in new forms of world money. In this regard, a crucial metamorphosis occurred in the 1970s. Throughout capitalist history, money has typically had some connection to a tangible commodity, usually a precious metal. It is not true, however, that precious metals have constituted the predominant money forms. Instead, paper monies, and since the 18th century, usually state-regulated national currencies, have generally served as the immediate means of exchange. These credit monies are effectively IOUs that circulate from hand to hand through one market transaction after another, based on the belief that they are backed by real economic assets. But as credit monies, so named because they are issued as credits against the assets and ability to pay of their issuer, they are not themselves intrinsically valuable. A US dollar bill, for instance, costs about three cents to produce, as does a $100 bill. Unlike commodity monies, such as precious metals, whose value is related to the socially necessary labor they represent, credit monies circulate based on estimates of the credit worthiness of those who offer them. When we carry paper money in our wallets or store it on a bank card, we effectively accept that the central bank that issued this money can guarantee its value. We trust that, thanks to its economic might, we can get real goods in exchange for the paper or digital currency it issues. Most of the time, this is a safe bet, but where state currency undergoes a crisis, as happened in Argentina in 2001, the credit worthiness of the national money evaporates, inducing a rush to convert it into commodities or more stable currencies. The predominant form of credit money is that issued by central banks, known as fiat money. These have usually been loosely tied to the value of a commodity, most often gold, or to the world's dominant currency, such as the British pound and the US dollar, which itself usually maintain a metallic link. Such ties have often been fragile. Witness the suspension of convertibility of currencies into gold during the Great Depression of the 1930s. But the idea that the world financial and monetary system can operate indefinitely without any established connection to a commodity is of recent vintage. Even during the era of the so-called Bretton Woods system, 1945 to 73, the world economy was regulated by a dollar gold standard. While the US dollar was the basic world money used for settling international transactions, it was legally tied to gold, each dollar being convertible from one 35th of an ounce of gold. And since they were valued in terms of dollars, all other currencies were simultaneously priced in gold as well. Of course, most of the time, convertible currencies will circulate without anyone bothering to cash them in for precious metal. By the late 1960s, however, things changed in the case of the dollar gold standard, as foreign holdings of dollars built up due to US balance of payments deficits. Investors and banks began to crash or cash in their dollars. In response, the American government chose to honor dollar gold convertibility only for central banks. Then in August 1971, with the American gold stock having fallen by $6.7 billion, billion, 
In the first half of the year, U.S. President Richard Nixon closed the gold window, declaring that even central banks could no longer, no longer convert dollars into gold. It soon became clear that this abandonment was more than temporary. The world had entered into an era of decommodified money, a global currency regime lacking any tie to an underlying commodity. With, Nick with Nixon's declaration, the world of money changed radically. The global financial system lost any anchorage in gold or any other commodity and became a pure and simple national credit money system or fiat money system. All other currencies which had been tied to the dollar similarly became unhinged and began to float in value, often swinging wildly in the course of a day. A new and volatile global environment emerged in which it became increasingly difficult for firms, particularly those operating multinationally and thus utilizing multiple currencies to predict the costs of investments or the scale of their earnings. The world economy entered an epoch of exchange rate volatility, of sharp fluctuations in the relative values of currencies, of the very sort that the Bretton Woods planners had sought to avoid. As a result, currency trading quickly became the world's largest market by far. As monetary instability became the order of the day, so did risk management. After all, firms that operated multinationally confronted the risk that profits made in a particular national market might be wiped out by devaluation of the local currency. A German multinational, for instance, that made a $50 million profit on its US sales and operations could find itself booking merely a $40 million gain at its home office in the, if the dollar declined by 20% against the mark or the euro today. Global businesses thus began to search for hedges against currency fluctuations turning to complex financial instruments known as derivatives, which are meant to provide protection from financial and currency volatility. Indeed, the timing here could not be clearer. Trade in derivatives known as financial futures began in 1972 when the Chicago Mercantile Exchange created the international money market. Business in currency futures, purchase of currencies at a certain rate at some future point in time commence the next year. During the 1980s, options on currencies were also introduced on the London Stock Exchange and the London International Financial Futures Exchange. And as much as derivatives have now been extended to a vast array of financial assets, the dramatic growth since 1972 has been driven by currency hedging. The combined effect of floating currencies, financial instabilities, risk management instruments, and currency speculation was an explosive growth in the market for foreign exchange, known as the Forex market. Forex, the global business in currency trading, has become far and away the world's largest market, and one that continues to grow spectacularly. <clears throat> um, sorry. The daily turnover in foreign exchange markets amounted to $15 billion in 1973, just as we enter the new world of decommodified de money. 12 years later, the daily Forex turnover had jumped 10 times to $150 billion, a figure that shocked many commentators at the time. Another 10 years on, even that amount looked paltry as daily Forex trading soared to $1.1 trillion. Yet the steep rise in currency trading was far from over. By 2004, the daily volume hit nearly $2 trillion, and by 2007, it had surpassed $3.2 trillion. These numbers, these numbers make little sense until we recognize the most currency trading is speculative in nature. To be sure, businesses operating multinationally need to regularly buy and sell currencies in order to make foreign investments or to conduct basic operations. But the bulk of forex trading bears no relation to the actual movement of goods or investment capital. By the mid-1990s, in fact, the daily volume of currency trading was equal to the average month monthly volume of trading goods and services. 
And by the late 1990s, the global forex trade was more than 10 times larger than the world's annual gross domestic product. So while currency trading became vitally important in an era of heightened monetary instability, it also became an end in itself. A site of tremendous speculative activities. If traders could accurately depict or accu accurately predict which currencies were likely to rise and which to fall, they could reap enormous profits without, without ever undertaking the long-term risks associated with building factories, buying machines, hiring workers, constructing supply and distribution chains, and so on. Currency, currency markets thus seemed to offer the capitalist utopia in which money breeds money. It just became a question as to guessing which monies would be winners and which losers. The extraordinary growth of forex trading thus drove those processes, frequently understood as the financialization of late capitalism. And here, derivatives feature prominently. Financial derivatives took off from the early 1970s on because they make it possible for the U.S. office of the same German multinational we have described to purchase a contract giving it an option to sell U.S. dollars at a set rate to the German mark thus preventing a loss of profits in the event that the dollar should fall. In the event of the dollar rising or staying steady, the firm should choose not to exercise that option and merely pay the cost of the contract, thus giving a straight profit to the option seller. But if the dollar were to fall, the German company would have protected its U.S. profits for a relatively small price. Similarly, a firm that expected interest rates to fall in one country and rise in another could purchase a swap contract by which it literally swapped the higher interest rate it expected to pay in one country for the lower rate it anticipated elsewhere, and vice versa in the case of interest-bearing securities. As for the term derivative, it simply refers to a financial contract whose price is said to be derived from some underlying asset. But in fact, most of the underlying prices are themselves predictions as to future value. Derivatives, or at least their proliferation in late capitalism, thus reflect a profound transformation in the form of money, in which currencies are no longer linked to past labor embodied in gold, but largely to future labor, to acts of production and exchange that are as yet unperformed. In this sense, they express a decisive mutation in the form of money in late capitalism. Of course, derivatives in raw commodities, particularly agricultural goods, like wheat, have been around for a long time. But the dramatic growth of markets in financial derivatives began, as we have seen, in the early 1970s. Indeed, derivatives markets quickly eclipsed those in stocks and bonds. In 2006, for instance, more than $450 trillion in derivative contracts were sold. That compares with $40 trillion for global stock markets and about $65 trillion of world bond markets in the same year. As we have seen, the explosive growth of derivatives was a response to a world economy characterized by heightened uncertainty about the capacity of money to measure values particularly prices and profits. Through futures, contracts, options, swaps, and other instruments, all meant to minimize risk by locking in an exchange rate or rate of interest in a given market, investors sought to overcome financial uncertainties. But the rise of these instruments also created tools with which companies could shift from conservative ta tactics of risk management entering currency and financial markets simply to protect their business operations toward aggressive strategies of speculation which actually increase risk as the world financial crisis that broke out in 2007 graphically demonstrates. In addition to allowing firms to hedge risk by buying contracts that protect them from sharp fluctuations in currencies, interest rates, or the value of various assets, derivatives also created new platforms for speculation by way of bets as to the movements of future prices for virtually anything. The immense speculative and hence destabilizing possibilities of derivatives reside in the way in which these monetize temporal shifts. As we have, as we have observed, 
like all fictitious capitals. Derivatives involve bets as to future values of currencies, interest rates, stocks, bonds, etc. In this respect, they mirror the new world of global money. If previously money had some tie to values based on past labor, embodied in gold, which was stockpiled in central bank reserves, today it is largely linked to fictitious capitals, such as the U.S. federal debt, denominated in bills and bonds sold by the U.S. Treasury. As a result, capitalists now try to price money and other paper assets in terms of future values by calculating their anticipated prices at some point down the road, a day, a week, a month, and so on. Increased financial volatility is inherent in such a situation, and if predictive models fail to capture their complex dynamics, then, all, then not only does their whole intellectual edifice collapse, as former U.S. Federal Reserve Chairman Alan Greenspan conceded during the crisis of 2008, but so can global markets. The tremendous instability in derivatives markets and the immense flaws in the mathematical efforts to model them is a product of a contradiction at the heart of capitalism. While survival for a capitalist firm pivots on the successful, i.e. profitable, translation of concrete labors into socially necessary abstract labor times, the fact that contending companies compete over the capture of values means that this, transla this translation is always precarious and on accumulation of failures to realize values can generate a systemic crisis. The same occurs at a more rarefied level in derivatives markets. After all, derivative pricing models which guide investors' decisions requires that all concrete risks, climatological, political, monetary, and more, be measured on a single metric. It is essential to, to derivatives pricing that the relative riskiness of early snow in Florida and the associated damage to the orange crop be measured against the risk of the yen rising against the dollar, or of the Bolivian government nationalizing the hydrocarbons industry. Derivatives markets must, in other words, be able to translate concrete risks into quantities of abstract risk. And they can no more do this in a reliable way than can firms invariably realize concrete labors as value, abstract labor, and certainly not at levels that guarantee profitability. While the global financial crisis brought that reality home with a crash in 2007 to 8, the writing had been on the wall since the collapse of Enron in 2000, at the time the biggest bankruptcy in history. Enron, case study in the occult economy of late capitalism. Perhaps no corporation better embodied the obscure practices of neoliberal speculative finance or the new forms of hyperfetishism than Enron, whose spectacular collapse was important of the crash of 2007 to 9. Launched in 1985 as a natural gas pipeline company, Enron underwent a stark metamorphosis in the 1990s. Not only did it evolve increasingly into an online bank and derivatives trader, the company's growth was also astronomical. Annual revenues of $4.6 billion in 1990 exploded to $101 billion 10 years later making the firm larger than Sony or IBM. Riding such growth, the company's stock soared to $90 a share. Then came the implosion. By the time it was over, more than $60 billion in shareholder value had been annihilated. From one of the most valued equities in America, Enron became a penny stock, trading at a laughable 36 cents a share. Explaining this colossal corporate collapse, most commentators have pointed to fraud and corruption. Both of these vices were certainly in abundance, yet there is something too easy about this narrative, focusing, as it does, on aberrance, rather than systemic mutations in millennial capitalism. For the Enron story was simply not possible outside the context of the system of wild money established since the 1970s. That Enron was the product of a zeitgeist, 
part of a unique moment in economic history can be gleaned by looking at its wider reception and perception. For five years, after all, Fortune magazine lauded the firm, reading it the most innovative in America. Even as the company's crisis was about to break, the magazine ranked Enron amongst its 10 stocks to last the decade, and the prestigious business magazine was not alone. Nobel Prize winning economist Myron Scholes, co-author of the formula for pricing derivatives, singled out two corporations as financial innovators of unique scope and power, General Electric and Enron. While his underlying analysis was clearly absurd, joining therein the derivatives pricing models he co-designed and which imploded in 2007, Scholes did point to the metamorphosis of these firms from industrial into financial corporations. In the case of Enron, this metamorphosis conformed to the post-industrial and post-modern model that was all the rage in the 1990s, under the direction of Jeffrey Skilling, who headed, oops, who headed its financial services division and rose to become president and CEO. Enron sought to shed hard assets in the US. In 1999, for instance, it's, it sold its oil and gas producing facilities and its regulated electric utility in favor of, ost of ostensibly intangible ones. Seduced by nonsense about virtual corporations, Skilling proclaimed that the energy company of the future won't be based on pipes and wires and generating facilities. It will be based on intellectual capital. So when entering into the fiber, fiber optics business, Enron officials mocked companies like AT&T for building actual telecommunication networks. Instead, Enron simply bought access to the networks of others, short-circuiting the development of actual infrastructure. With its soaring revenues and stock price, Enron looked like proof positive that in the virtual economy of late capitalism, immaterial assets, brand names, logos, smart trading networks are the key to profits, not labor linked to real means of production. Before long, this bit of hyper-fetishism would wreak havoc. As the company transmuted into a post-industrial corporation, derivatives trading assumed an ever larger role. The rush to derivatives came with Enron's decision to remake itself as, first, an energy trading firm, and secondly, a bank, and increasingly an internet bank, that extended credit to those with whom it traded. This strategy was premised on the neoliberal drive to deregulate prices. So long as the government regulated energy prices, volatility was limited, as was the space for profiting on price fluctuations. Yet as anyone who drives a car knows, energy prices are highly unpredictable. With governments deregulating prices, Enron rushed into this volatile market, signing contracts to deliver energy at a fixed set of prices over time. In the pro- oh shoot. I accidentally hit the thing and totally like went ahead five pages. Okay. In the process, it effectively became a derivatives trading firm. Price deregulation produces volatility. In the same way, the move into a world of floating exchange rates did. And since energy prices are inherently unpredictable, susceptible as they are to influence by war in the Middle East, a hurricane on the US Gulf Coast, sabotage of oil fields in Nigeria, an especially hot summer or cold winter in North America, they are a prime target of speculation. Correctly guessing the direction of events allows investors to monetize temporal shifts, i.e. to profit from accurately predicting future states, and guessing wrong can spell disaster. Salivating over prospects for the latter in a deregulated energy industry, Enron jumped into a series of hedge deals. One of the earliest involved an aluminum company in Louisiana, which bought its gas in local markets, but paid a price or paid a set price to Enron. Note here something crucial. Enron was not providing the gas, it was only guaranteeing a price. The aluminum firm continued to obtain its physical supplies of gas locally, but rather than pay a fluctuating price to local providers, it paid a fixed price to Enron, 
who assume the fluctuating local costs. This deal is a cl classic swap. Nothing physical was being traded, only two sets of prices, one fixed, the other fluctuating. In its pursuit of price stability, the Louisiana company bought a contract for a fixed price, while Enron sought to profit from gaps between the fixed, selling price, and fluctuating, buying prices. Because the underlying prices were derived from gas prices, a swap like this constitutes a classical derivative. And once it figured out how to make a profit on contracts like these, Enron quickly branched out into other hedge markets. It was soon doing billions of dollars in pulp and paper derivatives, essentially trading pulp and paper prices in the same way it sold gas prices. Next came derivatives in the weather. While the idea of the weather as an underlying asset seems a bit far-fetched, it is easy to see how trading volatile price could lead to commodifying the weather. After all, there are many companies whose prices and profits are dramatically affected by weather patterns. A hot summer in California, for instance, raises the price of electricity required to cool homes and factories. While a cold winter in Florida, to use an earlier example, adversely affects the orange crop, thereby raising orange prices. Governments, consumers, and manufacturers thus want protection against soaring heat and energy costs, while the energy firm fears an abnormally cool summer and the lower prices and profits it brings. Similarly, an orange juice firm dreads a cold winter in Florida and the higher prices for oranges a poor crop entails and would happily buy protection in the form of a weather derivative. And so hedges were, brought, were bought and sold on the weather a form of fictitious capital, it, it, if ever there was one. As Enron moved into the global casino in every conceivable sort of derivative contract. Indeed, as one analyst rightly notes, after 2000, Enron was, in reality, a derivatives trading firm, not an energy firm. And as it barreled into online trading, its metamorphosis accelerated, especially when, with, with the launch of Enron Online, the company added chemicals, aluminum, and copper derivatives to its operations. Online trading quickly became the center of Enron's activity. Indeed, within eight months of its launch, internet trading dominated the corporation's daily business, with deals hitting $2.5 billion per day. Having struck on derivatives as its cash cow, the company sought out ever newer markets, establishing EnronCredit.com in 2000, in order to trade credit derivatives, wagers as to the creditworthiness of a particular company. In this new and rapidly expanding sphere for derivatives, Enron would bet on a firm it considered sound by offering a reasonably priced credit derivative on it, effectively betting that it would not default and paying up if it did. If it thought otherwise, it would bet against it by trying to get another trader to assume the risk, which might involve a complex set of derivatives trades. A derivative of this sort is typically known as a credit default swap, CDS. But note two things again. First, no tangible asset is being traded here, just bets as to future states, in this case solvency or bankruptcy. Secondly, all of these wagers involve high degrees of uncertainty, and given their sizes and the amount of leverage involved, a number of bad bets could quickly trigger a financial meltdown of the sort that took place at the insurance giant AIG in 2008, when after it had defaulted on a mere $14 billion of the $1 trillion in CDS contracts it had sold, traumatizing the market, the US government bailed out the firm. Like, like I, AIG, Enron 2 made a number of bad bets. The effects of these were amplified by its creative and often illegal use of shell companies to take on huge debts related to its derivatives trades. Known as special purpose entities, SPEs, such shell companies are trusts created to hold some of the company's assets against which it borrows. Most importantly, a parent firm can move large amounts of debt off its books by transferring it to SPEs thereby protecting its credit rating and stock price. It is as if, as a borrower, I could create an alter ego who buys houses and cars on credit, yet without my credit rating and the rate of interest at which I can borrow being affected. More than this, 
it is as if I could then borrow from my alter ego, offering IOUs in return. By the time it disintegrated and Ron had set up an extraordinary 2,800 offshore units. By comparison, telecommunications giant AT&T had merely 36 at the time. But it was not just the proliferation of SPs, which was the issue. It was also their structure. Many of them extended the parent company credit in exchange for Enron stock, valued at a certain price. In effect then, Enron was borrowing from itself and offering IOUs, Enron stock, in return. But if Enron stock ever plummeted, then the parent company would have to assume this debt or extend ever more stock, since more collateral would be required to back up its loans. Something investors could be expected to notice. And this in turn would spark a downward spiral in the stock price, in turn worsening the debt picture and requiring that yet more depreciating stock be issued or the debt assumed by the parent company. All of this would lead to further sell-offs ad infinitum, infinity being measured here by the zero point of corporate collapse. And this is precisely what happened once the company's nosedive commenced. With speculators playing Enron's own game, but now by getting against, by betting against Fortune's beloved firm, Enron stock fell. More debt came onto its books, and investors now betting against its future, the stock tumbled further and further. In short, the very structure that allowed the company to expand via accumulation of fictitious capitals was also biased toward implosion as soon as financial opinion moved against it in a big way. To their chagrin, Enron executives were instructed in the most basic rule of fictitious capital, bubbles eventually deflate. Like a reversing river, the very momentum that had swept Enron to superstar status now propelled its astonishing collapse. Yet, to end the story here is to miss another key element in the Enron saga. Its implication Sorry, its implication um, in the imperialist practices of primitive accumulation. In the age of neoliberal empire, primitive accumulation is often accomplished by using the debt of nations in the south as a lever to expropriate land, natural resources, and industrial assets. These forms of accumulation by dispossession, to use David Harvey's opposite term, entail the exercise of enormous economic pressures by global banks. Western governments and neoliberal agencies, like the IMF and the World Bank, the press agents in the South into offering up public assets and natural resources to global creditors. Not surprisingly, this process took off in the 1970s as institutions holding dollars that could not be converted into gold sought out borrowers and found many of them in governments of third world nations. In the decade after 1973, more than $480 billion was loaned to countries in the South, quintupling toward or quintupling total third world debt in a mere 10 years. Then at the end of the decade, these third world borrowers were cruelly hammered by soaring interest rates on these loans. And as the world economy staggered into another recession, 1980 to 82, many debtor nations teetered on the brink of insolvency. Indeed, after Mexico announced in August 1982 that it was broke and could not repay its loans, some 30 countries lined up to refinance more than $400 billion in foreign debt. Rather than treat this as a crisis, Western bankers and bureaucrats saw it as an opportunity. The desperate need for debt refinancing was fashioned into a whip with which to impose neoliberal structural adjustment, programs of privatization, deep cuts to social service spending, and financial liberalization as conditions of new loan arrangements. Budgets, investment laws, economic policy, and the like were all effectively rewritten so as to further open the human and natural resources of the South to ever more intensive exploitation by capital from the North. Inevitably, none of these concessions lowered the debt burden. In fact, in the two decades after 1980, the external debt of third world countries more than quadrupled from $586 billion to over $2.5 trillion by 2000, and this only gave Western capital more stimulus to accumulate via dispossession. In addition to structural adjustment programs which opened up national economies to extensive foreign ownership, 
Capitalists from the North use debt for equity, equity swaps for giving loans in return for assets. Factories, mines, water systems, offices, hotels, pipelines, and more, thereby dispossessing local states and capitalists of their property. While this tactic was used aggressively throughout Latin America in the 1980s, it acquired a special ominous dimensions during the East Asian crisis that erupted in 1997. Not only did pressures from the IMF force the governments of these nations to open their banking, insurance, and securities markets to foreign firms, but the devaluation of local assets as a result of the collapse of currency values enabled foreign capital to buy them up on the cheap. Indeed, some, anal some analysts suggest that the invasion of American and Japanese capital into the region may have precipitated the biggest peacetime transfer of assets in the past 50 years anywhere in the world. It is in this context of systematic bullying and domination of indebted nations in the global south that Enron entered the stage of global predation. Over the years, Enron acquired rights to build a huge power plant in Dabal, India, about 100 miles south of Bombay, to construct similar plants in Turkey and one on an island off the coast of China to develop a nearly 2,000 mile long gas pipeline from Bolivia to Brazil, described by the Washington Post as Enron's scar on South America for the damage it would, it would wreak in Amazonian forests, to operate water and sewage systems in Cancun, Mexico, and in two regions of Argent Argentina, to run an electrical utility in Sao Paulo, Brazil, and to build a power plant in Indonesia. All these initiatives were part of a process of commodifying precious resources. Enron also moved aggressively into the global water business in order to profit from control over resources and or the means to generate and transport them, such as power plants and gas pipelines. Enron thus figured centrally as one of the new enclosers of the global commons, but enclosure of the global commons of dispossess dispossessing third world peoples of natural resources and the means of distributing them frequently pivots on presence from imperial states and their associated multilateral agencies, like the World Bank and the IMF. And Enron was well connected in this regard, closely associated with the Bush clan, which gave it access to two state governors, George W. in Texas and Jeb in Florida, and two presidents, George I and George II. On multiple occasions, White House officials intervened with foreign governments in countries like Mozambique, whose oil supplies were in the line of fire, or Argentina, where Enron wanted a share of the country's newly privatized gas company. The Argentine deal brought over 4,000 miles of natural gas pipeline into Enron's hands, giving it effective control over gas transport in the region's southern cone. Enron also moved into Argentina's energy market in a, way, in a big way and his machinations there contributed to the economic catastrophe that ripped through the country in 2001. Through these practices, Enron sought to dispossess people in the global south of land, water, pipelines, and water systems, and it was not above using violence to achieve these ends, as it did in India during the 1990s when it procured a contract to build a massive power plant in the state of Maharashtra, a contract so preposterously lucrative that even the World Bank twice concluded that it was utterly one-sided in Enron's favor. In addition to its ext extortionate contract, Enron also displaced poor Indians so that it could build storage tankers for liquid natural gas, an absolutely classic example of accumulation by dispossession. In response, anti-Enron protests escalated, and so did the company's tactics. According to Human Rights Watch, Enron colluded with police who beat and jailed protesters. Yet, as costs of the project rose and as anti-Enron protests mounted, the state government tried to wiggle out of the contract. In a typical act of neo-colonial arrogance, Enron declared that it would use contractual guarantees to begin selling off government properties in order to get its money, nevertheless imperial bullying, even when buttressed by interventions by the likes of U.S. Vice President Dick Cheney and Secretary of State Colin Powell, could not break the opposition. Social movements kept up the pressure, and the dispute wound its way through the courts until shortly before its collapse, and Ron effectively abandoned the project. 
Capital comes into the world dripping in blood from every pore. The Enron case is instructive in part because critical, critically probed, it provides a key to understanding the occult economy of late capitalism. Beneath the esoteric circuits of finance lie material practices of plunder of the world's resources and its laborers. As much as Enron tried to remake itself in America as a financial services firm specializing in derivatives, its operations always remained tethered to predatory practices in the global south. As Marx insisted in the crucial part eight of his life's work, capital comes into the world dripping from head to toe from every pore with blood and dirt. Performing his work of detection, Marx catches the world's rulers with bloody hands as Silco puts it. He exposes their crimes of slaughter and slavery. And so revealing capital to be a vampire, Marx changes it or charges it with sucking the lifeblood out of the workers of the world. And this imagery transposed into the African present animates the tales of vampires and zombie laborers that proliferate throughout sub-Saharan Africa today. Yet, however specific the tales we shall examine may be to their African context, they are not unique to that region. As Latin America too has endured the march of the predators, so does produced similar fables of modernity. On the heels of its debt crisis of the 1980s, Latin America was subjected to asset rating on a colossal scale. Betwe between the mid-1980s and the mid-1990s, as much as three quarters of all foreign direct investment in the region went not to finance new investment, but simply to buy up privatized public firms or financially troubled private ones, i.e. to take over existing assets, usually on the cheap. Yet at the end of all that looting and pillaging, the region was more indebted than ever, and the people were poorer. In the short space of two years, from 1998 to 2000, 20 million more people fell into poverty. According to the UN Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean, that brought the number of impoverished Latin Americans to 223 million, almost 44% of the population. Throughout the region, close to half the population toils in the so-called informal sector, working for meager wages without any form of health care, pension plan, or unemployment insurance. Little surprise then that stories of rapacious monsters hunting for body parts have found a new resonance, particularly amongst the poorest and the most disenfranchised. Such tales have flourished, for example, throughout the indigenous territories of Chipea, which traverse parts of Peru, Bolivia, and Chile. During the 1980s, rumors circulated of human fat being extracted from bodies and exported to the United States to lubricate cars, airplanes, computers, and other machines. In 1987 came legends of a special army of 5,000 slaughterers, author authorized by the president of Peru, seeking human fat as payment for the country's foreign debt. Then the following year, stories were disseminated about machine gun toting gringos invading schools and kidnapping children whose extracted eyes and organs were sold abroad. As the wealth and people of whole regions of the world are consumed by vampire capital from the north, as hunger and destitution haunt the lives of millions, it is hard to dismiss such fables as fantastic. Or better perhaps, it is difficult to regard them as merely fantastic for they comprise a genre of fantastic realism that illuminates the way human bodies are systematically ground up by the gears of global capitalism, a genre which is dialectically elaborated in Marx's theory of vampire capital. It is in this light that we need to ponder China Mayville's observation that the fantastic might be a mode peculiarly suited to and resonant with the forms of modernity this is certainly true of Shelley's Frankenstein, of an end of the vampire and zombie tales to which I shortly turn. As it is key, as it is of key sections of Marx's capital, where tables and chairs dance, commodities stand on their legs and speak. The vampire capital sucks the blood of living labor. Like their African counterparts, these recent Latin American tales are fables of monstrosity that map the contemporary devastations of global capital. And like their 19th century predecessors, they also hint at the discontent of the rebel monsters that comprise the hopeful underside of global capital's depredation, depredations.